Good afternoon, everybody. This is Kevin McGinnis uh, with the National Association of State EMS Officials, bringing you the April edition of the Community Paramedicine Insights Forum, along with the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health and Center for Learning, Innovation, and Research, and my partner in crime, Gary Wingrove um, at Mayo. Uh, we are looking forward to today's uh, session. We actually have a two-parter. Uh, uh, scheduled uh, for part one, we have um, Dr. Arnold O'Lear, who is the state EMS director in uh, South Carolina, who is going to tell us about the uh, community paramedicine pilot project explosion. Actually, not so much, uh, but they have expanded from the one pilot project that we had on uh, featured uh, several months ago. Uh, to uh, almost a dozen pilot projects um, in South Carolina. Along with uh, uh, Arnold is going to be Tony um, Fernandez from the EMS Performance Improvement Center in North Carolina, who is going to discuss data collection in community paramedicine programs uh, and what they're trying to do out of MSPIC for both North Carolina and South Carolina. Um, and then in part two of the program this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Howard Backer, who is the State EMS Director in California, uh, is going to join us for a discussion on the use of mid-level practitioners in community paramedicine programs. Um, so looking forward to that. It's not a formal presentation. It's more, uh, as I say, a discussion on the pros and cons of um, that approach to community paramedicine, um, mobile integrated healthcare. Uh, and that will be coming up in a little while. But back to um, part one of our program this afternoon, uh, I would like to introduce um, uh, Arnold DeLear and Tony Fernandez, and I will let you gentlemen take it away. Okay, thank you. Okay, so... Um, Thank you for all um, logging in and uh, listening to our particular presentation. First of all, I was going to uh, tell you a little bit about myself so it gives you some context. I have been EMS, been in EMS since 1982. I've uh, been the state coordinator since 2013. Um, I've done some EMS education since 1988 and uh, do some writing for HealthStream. Um, and I'm currently the state EMS director for the Bureau of EMS for the Department of Health and Environmental Control, which is a mouthful to say. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about our community paramedic program, which, as Kevin stated before, uh, it's kind of an explosion that has kind of happened in South Carolina. Uh, first of all, we started our pilot, our initial pilot in Avila in 2013. Um, it was, it's a very rural program. Um, it's almost an isolated county um, at the edge of our state. Um, initially funded by the Duke Endowment, and the program was, uh, has been very successful by the metrics that they have been able to, um, to get. Uh, but usually, uh, once you do a pilot program, then we, we usually have to extend it on to either a stabilized program or actually just go ahead and expire the pilot. And there were a lot of unknowns about our community paramedic program uh, on how it would operate outside of its original rural setting in South Carolina. And in South Carolina, we have everything from Charleston, Greenville, and Columbia, which are very highly populated urban centers, to Abbeville, Chester and other parts in between that are counties that have a very low population. Some have no hospitals and their transport times usually exceed over an hour, hour and a half one way to take somebody out of, um, out of their county to a, even a community hospital. So we weren't sure how this was going to work, how was it going to work with the mixed setting. We knew that the Abbeville program uh, was very well suited for them. And so we, um, we really had two choices, like I said, either adopted, rejected, 
And so we actually created a third option, and that was to expand the pilot and continue the experiment. And so the Bureau uh, did three things. We set up new guidelines for the expanded pilot. Um, that way we had better control. And number two, we would not have to relearn the lessons from the mistakes that, that were initially made uh, by the first pilot program. Uh, Abbeville was very successful, but um, you know, just like you enter into any new program, there's some pitfalls, so we want to make sure that the lessons that they learned were not repeated uh, as a mistake by someone else. And then the other big factor was that we had to approve what minimal education guidelines we were going to adopt because uh, while there is several good CP programs through the U.S., there was no one accepted program, and um, we have uh, uh, in a very interesting educational setting in South Carolina, uh, the makeup of it, and we wanted to make sure that we had at least minimum educational standards that would reflect what's going on nationally, and so we approved those. And then um, it just seems like everything was happening at one time. We were currently... Uh, at that time also rewriting the EMS regulations for the state on how EMS is run, and there was nothing in there about a community paramedic program, let alone what, what do you call these folks, and do they have a set credential, do they have a, uh, a different certification. And so we took on the model that Tennessee had taken, and that was to have a model of state endorsement for uh, education above and beyond um, a paramedic certification. So that's kind of the background behind it. Um, one of the things that, again, we were looking at was that we understood that based on what your viewpoint was coming in as an EMS agency was going to determine the CP model, whether you were rural, urban, uh, frontier, super rural, suburban, whether you were going to be a private service going into this, uh, whether you were going to be a municipal 911 system, was it going to be hospital-based, um, fire-based, which in South Carolina we have all of those as primary 911 providers. Um, we even have a situation where we had a regional education council that was going to be training uh, various regions because individually they can't afford it, but collectively they can provide for uh, that service. And, uh, and then we have the unique situation. We sit obviously next to North Carolina, but the Charlotte area kind of bleeds over into South Carolina and York County, and we even have the potential for an interstate program based out of Charlotte. And, of course, that brings a lot of other regulatory issues uh, with that as well. And so to set up the new guidelines for this expanded pilot, we basically put eight things that they needed to have, and most of these are kind of self-explanatory, obviously a letter of intent. But then the very first thing that they needed to do, probably the most important, was performing a community needs assessment because we knew that each area, whether it was metropolitan or suburban, was going to have its unique set of, of needs. And then they need to early on identify who their resources and partners were going to be. Um, they were going to need to choose the model based on the needs that they had. And then one thing that we did that kept us out of uh, statutory problems was that early on we decided not to expand the scope of practice for the paramedic. We were just expanding the setting. So what they do as a paramedic does not change. Where they do it and how they do it is what changes. And so the Office of General Counsel gave us a buy on it and we've been able to operate so far without really much, um, much of a problem. And of course, obviously, the education component, we wanted to know how they were going to educate their CPs. And we wanted, again, to make sure that they went this, through this program with both eyes open. Um, so they needed to pick what their revenue source was going to be um, uh, because we wanted their program to be sustainable. They didn't, we didn't want them to just start six months down the road, and when they run into trouble, uh, abandon the program, and then 
the folks that were in that gap that they were trying to fix were going to be slipping through that same gap again. And then lastly, uh, capturing the data. Uh, what were going to be our objectives, what are the standards, um, and then being able to have some kind of performance measure. So on the first part of that, we needed to determine what a win was and then determine uh, if the program has won. So if, uh, if all you have is a lot of frantic activity but you don't necessarily know what you're measuring, uh, you really don't know whether you're successful or not. So. Um, again, we made sure that the community assessment was primary of importance. Uh, what were the healthcare needs of that community? Was it going to be the high acuity calls, uh, a lot of comorbidities, uh, which I'll, I'll show you a slide later of what um, uh, the, the issue with Abbeville's program, um, where the concentration came. Um, we have uh, some that are concentrating on mental illness and drug abuse sort of a hot topic right now, not just, I'm sure, in South Carolina, but in other states with a high usage of opioids. Um, and then, of course, uh, the familiar faces, super users, they go by several different names. Um, and also, uh, immigrant population. South Carolina has a very large immigration population, um, and that's been really going on for years, and they um, kind of fill a lot of our service sector. Uh, at the hotels around the beach and in the northern part of the state, um, a lot of um, agriculture. So um, looking at this, we wanted to make sure that, again, their needs were going to change based on the fact if they were uh, urban, rural, super rural. And then uh, once they get in there, what was going to be their team? Uh, who was going to be in this? And just kind of a point that remember that it takes a village to run this, as Abbeville found out. I think at one time they had a list of probably 60 partners um, in that small community that they were partnering up with from everything from transportation to government housing, which again is not the typical set of players that EMS has, has to deal with. Um, and then choosing the, the suitable model. Um, again, to match their resources, to maximize their assets. Uh, and then more importantly, not just choosing this, but being able to flexible it. Three months down the road, they realize that their model is not working, then they need to change on the fly. Uh, this is something that uh, Abbeville learned early on, and again, why they were so successful, that they were, they were able to be flexible uh, with their program. And then, uh, you know, once they adopt that, they have to uh, make sure that it's sustainable. They have to own it, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, we want them to make sure that they plan for the future right from the beginning so that, um, like, for instance, not just the funding, but the model was going to work. And we asked them all to do a 24-month commitment once they started. And so some wanted to... Uh, do what Abbeville did, but again, not one size fits all. So once they got into this, they were able to figure out what they needed to do. Um, the scope of practice, like I, I mentioned before, um, we expanded the setting, uh, not the practice. Uh, when we had several things come up, for instance, uh, uh, the 1AC home test, which is similar to a BGL, that was fine. But if they showed up at a house and had to do a breathing treatment at home, and that did generate a patient care report and a transport, then we were impinging on home health care. And so we had to be very careful and dainty around that. So some things were legal, some things were not legal because it invaded into home health care. Uh, one of the things that, again, Abbeville did very successful is that they partnered from the very beginning with home health care. And so they run into no problems from the nursing industry. Um, in fact, home health care refers patients to them, and they refer patients back to home health care depending on what the needs of the patient is. Um, they had to work closely with a med control. Sometimes this is an independent med control from the 911 agency. Sometimes it, it's one and the same. And um, we asked them to be very... Uh, 
uh, clear early on to make sure that their protocols were, were not nebulous. Uh, we wanted them to get permission on stuff and not do something and ask forgiveness later. And then uh, part of that, we want them to do the research, find out what other programs are doing. Uh, we learn a lot from North Carolina and what North Carolina was doing, especially in New Hanover. Um, so some things will work uh, in your state, some things may not work. Uh, but again, the, the principal thing was we wanted them in their scope of practice to realize that the value of the CP program was the paramedic assessment. A lot of fancy things you can add to it, a lot of metrics that you can add, but the important thing is that paramedic going in, doing their assessment, and then following up on a weekly basis on those patients and find out whether they're improving, not improving, or being able to tell whether this is something that's going to be acute or chronic. Um, uh, I think I mentioned this before about identifying the resources and partners. Um, Abbeville was uh, very astute from the very beginning, and they partnered up with our state office of uh, rural health, and they were very instrumental in helping them obtain the grant from the Duke Endowment, which mirrored what the Duke Endowment had done for uh, New Hanover in, in North Carolina. And so we gained quite a bit of experience by uh, looking at what North Carolina had done there, and then again by partnering up with them, uh, they were able to help them with a lot of other resources, such as helping them with the blueprint and other things that they were able to um, to generate for them, which are almost too numerous to mention. But they were such a help to them and to other rural counties that uh, wanted to uh, begin a CP program. And they also uh, were able to collectively collect, as I call it, herding cats from all the different agencies and all the different scenarios around the state to a group that we loosely call the community uh, paramedic uh, group. Um, so that, again, um, make sure that uh, you don't overlook that as a good resource because every state has a rural community. Then on the education guidelines, um, we looked at 250 hours, although looking at now, most of the programs that we have going probably exceed over 300 hours. But we had to set a minimum so that nobody would kind of test for waters on that. One of the things that's kind of unique to South Carolina is that we have uh, three med schools in different regions. We have one in Charleston area, one in Columbia, one in Greenville. And many of our programs have partnered either directly or indirectly with them. Uh, part of that is being able to glean the medical knowledge from the physicians, but also we told them that it was important for them not to skimp on the clinical experience. So they shadow the healthcare practitioners in those areas where the CPs will be involved, whether it's diabetic education or wound care or pulmonologists, or like in Charleston, they, um, they do LVATs, so they'll have cardiologists that will have the CTs shadow them. Um, another thing that we did was we had to uh, uh, create some kind of an endorsement. And so we set guidelines for what they needed to do. Um, and we set um, that as well. We will also approve any out of state training that meets or exceeds uh, our minimum training, such as what Abbeville did at the beginning before we even had any guidelines. And they, of course, used the Hennepin model. Um, as far as revenue sources, we make sure that their program had to be sustainable. Um, so it made them think early on, how are we going to pay for this? Are we going to get a grant? Uh, how can we set it up so that when there is future CMS billing, we will get paid for the services that we're rendering? Will we be also funded by the community hospital through uh, deferred admissions or revenue sharing as they have done in other states. Yeah, this is kind of new ground for South Carolina. We've seen it in other states how they did it, but it's always going to be different when you introduce it to a new state. So we made sure that they looked early on to developing funding partners, not just 
for now, but for the future to make sure that their program is going to be sustainable. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that uh, the data that was going to be collected uh, was valid and that was going to be measuring what we're supposed to be measuring. A unique thing to EMS is that EMS has always been episodic. You get a call with a finite beginning and a finite ending, and that's it. And then you run another call. Uh, so you have all these episodes that are out there, whereas community paramedicine is it's periodic. It's serial. Um, you're visiting the same people um, on a, in a different setting. So how are we going to capture uh, these events? What do we call these events? We can't really call them an EMS call. Uh, do we call them a medical visit? Uh, and then defining other terms. Do we call this, these people patients, clients, medical contacts? So a lot, of, a lot of problems that you can run into medical legal when you look at your state statute and state regulation, uh, what exactly you call these events. And then performance measures. How do you know you're successful? How do you measure a win? Um, you can have a lot of frantic activity, and it looks really good on paper, but at the end of the day, did we save lives? Did we save money? Are we making a difference? And, again, we need, we need good data so that you can adjust and make course corrections like Abbeville did. Um, and then take that data that you have obtained and being able to share it with other CP programs so that they can be successful too. Um, so all of this, really, we needed to develop what was going to be acceptable universal data elements, um, which we heard about last year um, when we came to the EMS on the Hill and there was a CP summit, and we talked in, in great length, we heard um, about measuring strategies, and we heard about the 17 essential elements. Um, so we took these elements and began to look at the data that we were collecting for Abbeville. And with the assistance of the South Carolina Office of Rural Health and the EMS PIC in, in North Carolina, they looked at these and meshed them into a framework where we believe that we have a good solution for our state and perhaps maybe a universal capture for these elements. Some of these elements are already captured in Nemesis, although they may be limited. Other elements are captured by third-party software that have made um, modules for their particular software things like ESO and Zoll and uh, Image Trends, Cerner, Epic, which the last two were hospital-based. But again, if you cannot measure something, how do you know you're being successful at it? So the map that uh, was developed, uh, again, this is just a, a copy of what we received last year. And we began uh, putting this um, kind of on a draft board and looking, okay, so looking at what we do, how does that match these data elements that are in various categories, whether it's a structure or it's outcomes uh, or balancing uh, or, or even processing. So all these things come together as a underlying framework, but then you have to put meat on these bones and be able to designate, okay, this is what exactly we're measuring when it comes to a clinical measure. Um, not just the vital signs, but the various things that a CP does when he goes to a house, um, whether it's um, looking at the medications and reconciling those, or whether it's uh, looking at the lab values from the last visit that he had to the hospital. All these things are clinical operations and metrics that we should have, but there's really nothing in NEMSIS or an existing overall software that capture all these things. So we put it out there for about uh, 90 days, and we got uh, 10 uh, different uh, groups that came together uh, to expand the pilot. So Abbeville is going to continue. 
Uh, they're a uh, 911 provider for the county of Abbeville, very rural. Um, again, they're the 911 public EMS service. But then we had uh, Greenville County EMS. They are uh, the largest EMS service, 911 service. Um, uh, I guess uh, Charleston is probably running as many calls, and so is Richland now. Um, it's just a population explosion in, in these three areas in South Carolina because of a lot of industry that's moving in. But Greenville County partnered up with the Greenville Hospital System. It's the urban, um, very public 911 service. Um, the hospital system also houses uh, two things. Uh, the medical school in the upstate uh, in Greenville, and also the Institute of Pre-Hospital Medicine at GHS, which is in Oxville. They started that program to collectively educate paramedics in all things EMS. Uh, they began um, by teaching uh, first-year resident medical students the EMT class. They, um, in order to become a doctor through their school, the very first year, the very first thing they do is they go through an EMT class. So that gives them a, a great way to measure uh, their post-med school experience uh, with EMS. Uh, it gives them at least a point of reference. So that was the first thing they did, and then they um, began working with existing paramedics system in doing um, clinical education and simulation education, and then that turned into um, the program that they're doing now with the community paramedics. And then uh, thirdly, we have uh, Bowers EMS, that's a privately owned service, and Palmetto Easley Baptist, which is a hospital that's owned by two other hospital franchises in South Carolina, but very independent. It's uh, mostly suburban and rural. And they partnered up with a uh, technical college, Tri-County Tech, and they use the Hennepin um, model as far as the, all the materials um, and, and all the educational components. They have a memo of understanding with Hennepin to use that material. Um, and they're working out fairly well right now. They're still in the educational process, and I think they expect to graduate a class in a couple of months. Um, Charleston EMS, uh, they are a obviously urban public 911 system. Berkeley County, which is the county just northwest of Charleston County. Um, you may recall that Berkeley County, I believe, got the um, Volvo plant. So they have a lot of um, manufacturing as well and a large population explosion along with Charleston County. Uh, Piedmont Medical Center EMS, uh, which is a suburban um, hospital-based program. Uh, Piedmont Medical Center also provides the 911 service for that county. And that's located in the northeast portion of uh, of the state uh, near Charlotte. Richland County EMS partnered up with Pemetto Richland Hospital, uh, which has several hospitals based in Columbia, South Carolina. They are mostly urban, but they also extend into the suburban area and even rural area of their, of their county. Um, that is a urban MIH model um, as opposed to most of the other CP services we have, which are um, uh, true community paramedic programs. Then Medicare, uh, it's hospital-based, again, with a medical school um, in Charleston. Roper LifeLink is another uh, hospital-based uh, EMS CP service out of Charleston. We have PD Regional, which is one of our educational groups in the state and they are developing a program to teach rural counties in their area the community paramedic um, component so they can partner up with other smaller counties and be able to have a regional community paramedic program. 
and then finally Trident Health uh, partnered up with American Heritage, which is a private ambulance service, and they also have a urban and suburban area. So all these programs uh, are currently going. Um, in this graphic, you'll see kind of where they're located. Uh, it's interesting to note we have four in the um, Charleston area. Uh, they have actually partnered up with each other to make sure that they don't cross um, too many lines. Uh, each one is specializing in uh, particular patients, um, but they, uh, they're actually collectively working together for different hospitals or different EMS services in that area. Um, this is Berkeley County, just above Charleston. This is a PD region based out of uh, Florence. Um, this is Richland. This is York County, um, Greenville County. This is the existing Abbeville County. And um, Bowers is in Pickens County, which is a rural area. So, so far, this is um, the patient contacts that we've had, uh, just uh, over 280 patients or so um, from the three services that are currently running. Uh, they hit the ground running um, as soon as the program started. Uh, we have other ones that are in the process of finishing up uh, their educational component. And as you can see there, some are dealing mostly with uh, the super users and comorbidities, um, and some are dealing with um, some other nonspecific issues that they may have in the area. In the Charleston area, uh, one of the CP programs is going to be dealing mostly with mental health, while another one is going to be dealing with comorbidities, and another one is going to be dealing with cardiac uh, surgery issues. So it's interesting as that's kind of a symbiotic relationship between those four services. And then as far as data tracking, as you can see, this is all over the, all over the map. Some are using EMS charts. Some are using Excel spreadsheets. Some are using Cerner, which is a hospital-based uh, data system. Uh, some are using um, Epic. Uh, some are using ESO. And again, everybody's collecting data. We just want to make sure they're collecting data within the same range of information. Uh, while an urban may collect some information, it may spill over into what a rural will, depending on what the needs assessment was and what their CPs are doing. And so we really need to have an umbrella of uh, a universal capture of all this information. This is kind of a graphic of what Avial uh, uh, profile is and what their population is as far as the, the patients. You can see most of the patients that they have, the majority have uh, multi-diagnosis, so these are the comorbidities. Uh, very few are just singular, and this is, again, something that we have seen in, in other programs as well. And so looking at the missing piece here, uh, we have really a call for uh, collaboration in getting a good data set for CP and mobile integrated health care. Um, a lot of information is being captured out there, but not one universal data set exists. So that leads to several problems, uh, a lack of appropriate and validated measures, um, being able to justify that you're doing quality care uh, versus the cost of investment. Uh, difficult demonstrating uh, the connections between what a CP does and outcome. And there's really no standard definition for some of the interventions that, that we do. So the overview um, on the, the measurement strategy that we had from last year's summit looked at some of these individual elements and then we were able to expand on those. Um, again, some of the things that we know we're capturing well, but in various different pieces. Uh, for instance, NEMSIS is really good at capturing primary assessment, but when it comes to the community paramedic, 
the information that's captured in NEMSIS is li really limited to the vehicle and the role, um, and it doesn't really expand on what a, a community paramedic does. But if you look at the, the regular role of a paramedic, the, the primary assessment, most of the elements on that is found there. So where we kind of lack, it's, it's kind of seeing half of, of, of the picture here. Um, we, we can capture on NEMSIS procedures and medications and demographics and, and, and times when we come in, when we go out, vital signs and the assessment, but really there's not a place for lab. And, and more than that, when you consider and go beyond that, um, there's all kinds of things that we're doing that were identified that needs assessment that we're not really capturing, such as resource referral. How do we, how do we capture the fact that we refer these folks to um, Medicaid for funding of their medication or a particular program? Um, how do we capture a falls assessment and prevention, uh, injury prevention? How do we capture intervention with mental health um, and being able to provide them transportation to that mental health. Um, how do we capture patient uh, education on diabetes or another particular problem that they may be having? And, and how do we capture medication reconciliation? So all these things that we're doing but don't have really a good way to capture it. And um, as, as once was said, without data, you're just another person with an opinion uh, thinking that you're, you're doing good. So now we come to the portion that I'm going to ask Tony Fernandez to uh, jump in. And this is uh, the going from episodic to con the continuity of care or continuum of care uh, about the master patient input. Tony? Hi. Can everyone hear me? Well, thanks for um, giving me some of your time today. Um, I appreciate it. And um, just to highlight uh, what Arnold was saying, um, one of the things that is very important for uh, community paramedicine uh, in terms of data collection is, again, as Arnold was stating, going from an episodic to more of a uh, periodic or a serial um, system of, of data collection. And um, a few slides back, Arnold was showing uh, a few things that are not collected in NEMSIS. Um, but we, uh, we've identified through uh, rides with, um, we have an EMS specialist, his name is Sean Kay, uh, longtime paramedic. He's actually rode with uh, uh, every community paramedic system in North and South Carolina as of the end of last year. And what he did was he went, went through and tried to find other data sources or data sources that we can use as a template to find how we collect all these other things. Um, I, I think the goal is to try and collect them in some standardized fashion like NEMSIS so that when we are comparing, we're comparing apples to apples. And if we move uh, back towards the master patient index, um, in reading, I'm sorry, in writing uh, with all these other systems, one of the things um, that was identified was that there, again, these, these are going to be patients who are, who we've seen before. So we need to integrate um, data systems and, and data uh, throughout the continuum of care. We're not, it, a history for a community paramedicine, while history is important in all of our pre-hospital calls, we'd like to get it everywhere. Um, it's particularly important for a patient that you're, you're seeing on a continuous basis. Um, so one of the things that the Master Patient Index can do is pre-populate some of these things. Um, if you, you can move on to the next uh, slide. Um, and, and match patients um, not to themselves, not only in a single database, but across databases. So in other words, right now, um, what we're developing uh, for, our, for our states is to have the ability to not only uh, identify the, the individual episodes when folks uh, requested 911 service, um, but to link them across time so that you have one patient and you can develop things like a gold record where uh, in one patient in, uh, encounter you had you had great data collection, you had history, you had you had uh, medical compliance, you had everything you needed. The next time you saw them, not so much. Uh, you can fill in, you can backfill some of that information so that every time the community paramedic is there, um, they have a full set of information. And when you scale that out, 
uh, and you bring in other databases, uh, essentially the idea would be to link with, if there's a, an emergency department database, you'd link with that database. So you can fill in, you can link across databases and fill in things like um, if you're if you're so interested, um, uh, pay status. If they if they have insurance, you can um, you can fill in things uh, about about what happened on the on on their stay in the emergency department the last time they were there. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. So again, the the idea is to facilitate things um, that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise, such as patient tracking, um, do uh, analysis and data reporting across time um, and events. Um, and you can look at if you're implementing uh, for an individual uh, who's being seen by a community paramedic, if you're implementing some interventions to improve medical compliance or um, improve compliance with their uh, with their discharge um, summaries, you can you can track these things across time to see if there was a change pre and post that intervention. Um, and if we can move on, one of the ways to do this. Um, for a master patient index is to link across databases um, and to link in one individual database. Um, to do that, you need some type of identifiers. And we're, we're very, very early in the process of, uh, of trying to develop this master patient index, but we found um, some pretty encouraging things. Um, if we're talking about uh, linking patients uh, to themselves, essentially, um, with names, social security numbers, and date of birth, um, we have uh, we're only missing all three of those things uh, about eight percent of the time, um, which is encouraging. Um, this is across all records. So um, when you get to things like a master uh, a master patient index for community paramedic patients who will be seen multiple times. Um, this will just get better and better, and then we can link them. We can not only link them with their community paramedic visits, but we can link their cares uh, and their records to any 911 visits that happen in the meantime. Um, so you can really get a full view of what's going on with that patient and provide better care. Uh, so that is um, that is what I have on on community paramedic uh, data collection and on the master patient index. Um, Again, my name is uh, Tony Fernandez. I'm the research director here at the EMS Performance Improvement Center. Sean Kay, um, he is our EMS specialist, and he is uh, really the, the individual who put in all this, all the time to get this data set together, um, riding with all the systems in North and South Carolina. And um, Dr. Ellier, he's uh, he he was he was presenting earlier today, and he's um, he's been really instrumental in this work as well. Um, so that's, again, thank you for me, and I guess uh, uh, we will be open for questions now. Yes. Yes, honey. Um, and uh, thank you very much. I, um, I found this presentation fascinating. We actually heard a portion of it at the NSEMSO meeting a couple of weeks back, um, and I think that uh, both aspects of this, the uh, expansion of the pilot projects or programs, um, in a variety of communities in South Carolina, uh, as well as the data component, are uh, are fascinating. Um, I'll start with a, a question um, first uh, for Arnold. The education program that you folks have adopted um, seems to be in the ballpark of ours for the uh, national consensus program um, out of uh, Hennepin and elsewhere. Um, do you? Um, is it similar to that, uh, 100 hours of uh, didactic and a couple of hundred hours of clinical, or does it uh, have a different mix? It's about 125 and 125, but at the end of the day, the clinical tends to extend a lot more. One of the things that was kind of unique, um, particularly with the Richland um, County EMS uh, program that they have, uh, there's, they, they have a unique system because their med control is based out of a teaching hospital med school. And so as the CP students are following these practitioners, when does the clinical begin and the didactic end? Because they're learning almost on the job of what they're doing. So theirs is very, very heavy on the clinical um, after they have the initial lectures uh, with the physician. 
um, the one that's being done in uh, Tri-County Tech, uh, they have a whole host of clinicians that are coming in, not just physicians, but um, home health care and, and various ones. And so they, their mix is very similar to what's being done at Hennepin. Um, uh, for obvious reasons, they're, they borrowed the entire curriculum, even their objectives. Uh, and are using them there and are using subject matter experts in those areas um, to, to do the teaching. So two different approaches, but at the end of the day, they're, they're both putting well over the intended 250 hours, which we kind of set as the line in the sand. We didn't want them to go under that. And we knew early on that once they get into it, they discovered that, oh, yes, we need to cover this. And, we need to cover this other because of the needs assessments that were discovered that this is what we need to do. Um, and, and this is very true in the urban areas where they discovered as they began looking at these things that they have a lot of patients with opiate addiction and, and those sort of things that were not originally part of the program, but they see how this dovetails very well, uh, not just as a pre-hospital experience, but as a out of hospital experience and one of the things that we talked about early on when does the out of hospital experience begin and pre-hospital begin since ems is kind of involved in, in, in really all of that so yes so it, it does it does kind of match the same but uh, other ones um are, are, are a bit different in the mixture uh, but uh, at the end they come up with um, about the same number of hours or more Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and Tony, um, I'm, I, I get, I understand where, I think I understand where you're heading um, with the index. Um, have you looked at the um, CPMIH performance measures project um, that uh, started to evolve a couple of years ago? Um, it was led by Matt Zavadsky and Gary Wingrove is also one of the folks and sort of the steering group uh, of that. Uh, are you familiar with that work? And if so, I'm just wondering uh, if you've used some of that in consideration of the index. And I realize that you're doing more of a patient episode of care matching um, process so that you can get a, um, an ongoing um, picture of care. Uh, but I just wondered if you'd uh, run across that. We have. Um, so uh, the performance measures, um, uh, they do a great job of identifying kind of um, what you want, what, what you'd want to assess um, if you were measuring performance. Um, I think the way that, so for instance, uh, how, many, uh, how many medications were administered to your, your community paramedic patients, your community paramedicine patients. Um, uh, I think the, what we're, uh, the way we're coming at this is to try and make sure that um, we're collecting the the information in the same way. Uh, so, in other words, uh, there's there's a few different ways you can you can you can phrase the the question and collect the information about medications. Um, and if you ask them in different ways, you you may be getting a slightly different answer. Uh, so, essentially, we're we what the idea was to take the performance measures that were out there and try and work backwards, so to speak. So we can collect a uh, build a data system that can collect data to speak to those performance measures, um, and then uh, and and then not only be able to make those assessments in, in over a short period of time, but throughout the continuum of the patient's care. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm glad to see that you uh, that you uh, integrated consideration of that. Um, Gary, do you want to unmute um, our lines and uh, see if we have any other questions out there? There's, there's three in the chat box. Do you want to hit those first? Um, I think I'm going to do those one-on-one -on -one with the, the questioner. They're sort of not specific to uh, the South Carolina program. They're more sort of a general set of questions, and I've offered okay. to take those on offline. Okay, I'll unmute the line. The conference has been unmuted. Okay, um, uh, I did have some questions that came in through the chat box um, that were sort of more generic um, questions to 
community pair medicine, and um, I've offered to, uh, I'm going to take those on offline with the, the questioner. Um, if there are any questions uh, anybody has for either Tony uh, or Arnold uh, on their presentation. Okay, well, um, sounds like you told us everything we need to know, guys. All right. So thank you very much again for uh, taking the time to be with us today uh, for this presentation. I would just uh, tell everybody that um, you can go to the cpif.communityparamedic.org website that you registered on for today's program, and there is an archives button. Um, this program will be added to the archives uh, within the next uh, couple or few days, uh, and we'll let everybody know uh, who was on when that happens. Um, so let's move on to part two of our program. Um, we uh, are very pleased to have Dr. Howard Backer, um, who is the state EMS director in California. Uh, he and I had a discussion at the Ms. Hemsum uh, spring meeting about the use of mid-level practitioners uh, in community paramedicine programs, and we are familiar with uh, uh, nurse practitioners and PAs being used uh, in some programs around the country uh, and outside the country, uh, in particular in states that uh, at this point are trying to do some community paramedicine or mobile integrated health care programming, um, but uh, that have laws that limit the ability of paramedics to actually perform those roles. Some services are using uh, mid-levels uh, that are being made mobile by going out in ambulances. Um, and uh, we've actually had one program uh, featured on uh, the Community Paramedicine Insights Forum. That was the Mesa, uh, Arizona Fire Department. Uh, there's another program in the southern part of Arizona uh, doing a similar um, type of mid-level uh, practitioner use. And then we're aware of um, other programs that are using mid-levels in order that they're able to uh, be reimbursed for some of the care that's being provided as the mid-levels can uh, charge for the, the types of care that they provide, whereas CPs are not able to do that uh, in most locations um, other than Minnesota. Um, so. Those are, um, that's by way of leading into uh, uh, Dr. Backer, and uh, I'm going to uh, let, let him um, sort of provide the context of his interest in this subject. Uh, and uh, again, this is not a presentation, this is uh, a discussion for all of those who are on the line. Uh, Dr. Backer? Uh, thank you, Kevin. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay, good. Uh, well, Kevin framed this uh, quite well, and uh, the background on this is that California also, very much like South Carolina, has pilot programs. We have 12 pilot programs going in five different uh, sub, you know, uh, topic areas, <clears throat> but it's done under a special um, a special pilot program uh, legislative exemption where we can again, an exemption from our, our very restrictive um, paramedic uh, statute, which limits the where paramedics can practice and where they have to take patients. Uh, and I think it's similar to some other, other states. So in the, in the meantime, when we, when we put out the call for, the, uh, for proposals for the pilot project, it was Back. And there were successful projects going on around the country, but we, we got the responses, but many of them were not, had not been really thought out. I mean, we were able to, to find a, a dozen good projects, but then as it evolved and we got going on these projects and, and our providers started to see, hey, this is, uh, this is really a possibility. These projects are getting going and, and they're serious about this and, and it's a, you know, the potential, and the more and more talk there was around the country, they started to see and understand that this is part of the future of EMS. And so we got a lot of 
um, was wanting to get in uh, to the pilots, but it was too late at that point because we had to go through a very elaborate approval process. It's, it, the program is actually run by another department, a uh, state-level uh, department um, outside of, of EMS, although it's the same agency. And um, so it, it couldn't, there was no way anyone could get into the pilot. And yet they, they wanted to feel like they weren't going to be left behind. They wanted to kind of get their foot in the door in their community. So we started getting a lot of inquiries about using mid-level practitioners. Now, I had met um, earlier on with the people from the fire chief and the medical director from Mesa, Arizona, and they were talking to me about, about their model. And they've actually been invited to by our fire chiefs in California to, to talk about their model. Um, they're, they're really going around and promoting it. And in fact, they did get one of the innovation grants from CMS in this last year and got a lot of money to look at this. Um, but here's what's coming up now. Now we have people calling us and saying, well, can we do this? Yeah, and they're talking about putting mid-level practitioners in an ambulance and doing a program. Um, well, we so here and here's what I want in terms of feedback. I'm not going to advocate or talk about any particular program, but we have uh, agencies, and they're generally more fire agencies than the private, wanting to either put a nurse practitioner or uh, a PA on an ambulance. But they haven't really thought it out, and nor had we in terms of the implications. And although I know that it's pretty specific to state regulations and rules as to how this would look. I really want to get some other state feedback on what's going on in your state and how would it, how would you see it working in your state. And so here's the specifics. You know, nurse practitioners and, um, and, and PAs in California uh, are with their, have a different licensing board and obviously a different scope of practice uh, and are considered more uh, not fully independent practitioners, although nurse, nurse practitioners are, are, I think, can fall under that designation. They do have to have a physician uh, oversight, um, whether that physician is just available for questions or has to be on site depends on, on which license you're talking about. Um, but we started realizing that, okay, if you pair one of these with a paramedic, and you send them out on a call that came in through 911. You may or may not send them out in a 911 ambulance transport uh, vehicle. Maybe they, they would go even in, in a separate vehicle. Then how are they part? Are they part of the EMS system? In California, we decided yes because nurses. Uh, you know, if, if you are mobilizing resources through EMS and their EMS resources then we argue that they would fall under the medical direction of the medical director, thereby falling under those protocols. Um, and while the nurse practitioner could treat and release the patient in the field and bill for them, um, the question then comes up was, could the nurse practitioner tell the paramedic to take the patient to an alternate destination? And I would say no, because it, it, it had, again, that has to be part of the EMS system protocol. The other part is I, I, I realize I'm not really clear on what the role of the paramedic is. Is the paramedic just driving this daisy? I mean, are they just driving this person around? Are they there in case what they think is a minor injury, you know, uh, uh, say arm pain turns out to be angina and the person codes and they need a paramedic to do ALS? Um, I, I'm really not clear on the role of the paramedic and why this nurse practitioner needs a paramedic. Uh, I know Mesa has made arguments that this is a cost-effective model, but frankly, I don't see it because it makes a lot more sense to have a nurse practitioner in a clinic seeing 20 patients a day than going out on a rig to specific calls, maybe seeing six patients a day. So I'm going to stop there. Those are just a few of the issues that we're looking at as we get these calls saying, can we do this? And we're trying to think through the issues. I'd really like to hear from others as to how you've thought through this. 
Wow, what a lot of what a lot of uh, moving parts to the question. Uh, this is Kevin, and um, I, I would just toss in at this point, and I, I would really look at Gary Wingrove too for some response on this because he and I have slightly different views on how these things work. But one of the um, differentiators that we've um, discussed in uh, the EMS 3.0, for instance, uh, paper, uh, the difference between MIH and CP uh, is that you know, mobile integrated healthcare is really an administrative arrangement um, of players, uh, whether they're EMS providers, uh, community paramedics, um, or doctors, PAs, NPs, et cetera, dentists, dental assistants, that to, to, um, it, it, through a contract or other device to offer some form of mobile care um, in a community. And generally, MIH doesn't fall under uh, the purview of the state EMS office, for instance, because you're dealing with a whole bunch of um, professionals or providers who are licensed by other entities. And so the state EMS office really doesn't have much in say. Um, and so that sort of begs the question of whether a MESA or any unit um, using a nurse practitioner or PA uh, on the ambulance for CP purposes is it is CP or whether it's MIH. If it's MIH, uh, maybe it is out of sight of the purview of the state EMS office. Um, but boy, it's certainly that is the one gray area in between MIH and CP um, that really presents itself. And you know, frankly, an EMS system, and we do allow um, non-EMS licensees to participate in the system. I and mean, a good example of that is flight nurses um, and that may be uh, utilized on helicopters by licensed flight programs um, in the state. So um, you know, that it's a, a really interesting question, and I, I don't know if Gary wants to weigh in on that or anybody. The lines are all open. Everybody is unmuted, so... Um, I welcome any comments. Yeah, Kevin, it's Gary. I, um, I'm glad Dr. Backer brought this up because it's something I'd never even conceived of uh, in the past. Um, many of our states don't limit the practice location of the paramedics, and if the nurse practitioner is billing, I think they're doing it under the auspice of a clinic. So in a state like where I am, I'm not sure there's any conflict, but in a state like California where the practice location of the paramedic is limited by statute, it may be a bigger bigger issue. And beyond that, i got to think this one through a little bit because this is brand new to me, and uh, I think it's a great question. I'm glad I got brought up today. So we see the same issue in, in South Carolina where we've had a couple of hospital system that are partnered up with a flight service and they wanted to have their flight nurses visit on their downtime with a paramedic in a vehicle, not an ambulance, some kind of a vehicle, uh, some patients. Um, and so it, it kind of did beg the question, so why is the paramedic there? Was he driving Miss Daisy or did they feel safer because the two of them were going as opposed to one? And um, we, we didn't, really didn't have much of a solution. And again, it's, it's sort of an MIH program. And, and like um, Kevin was saying, it's kind of outside of the purview of the state office as a regulatory board. And that, that's also another thing. Now, we have, we have given dual credential to, to nurses that are attached to the helicopter service or the ones that are attached to critical care units like the, the center that does the transplants. We give them an EMT license for free, but they're, they're called a specialty care EMT, and they're only allowed to ride in that particular unit for those particular cases where they have a specialty, like NICU nurses, PICU nurses, and CCU nurses that do the heart transplant. But um, yeah, what you describe is kind of a horse of a different color. Um, not really sure that they necessarily need the vehicle and the paramedic to be there. Um, it's it's a completely different paradigm. 
Are there other comments? You know, it, that, Carl, that, that raises a good, a good question here in terms of public perception. You know, when, even when we have flight nurses or the types of nurses that you describe or technicians, you know, like this, we certainly have um, respiratory therapists will go along on some critical care uh, ambulance transports, interfacility transport. But all of those uses are very, um, very specific to that type of transport. And I think, you know, to the degree the public would ever look at it, that they certainly would look, I guess, at a helicopter, medical helicopter arriving. They're expecting to see people who will come in and manage a critical emergency. And that's what we deliver as the EMS system. And that's what the state EMS office, you know, assures through licensing and oversight of those operations. Um, this is so. This is very different. Um, and again, kind of begs the question of stretching. Maybe are we really stretching CP too far, or is it not CP at all, but MIH? In which case, it's not really EMS. It's a you know, sort of a multi-provider model that EMS might might participate in. Um, and the, the thing that's problematic is if you're actually putting these um, mid-levels into an ambulance or any kind of vehicle with a star of life on it that says, you know, Abbeville County EMS or Mesa Fire Department paramedics or uh, what have you, are we um, sort of offering the public a service that may be misleading uh, in that if somebody flags that unit down, uh, expecting it to be able to provide full uh, EMS provision, or if that unit gets dispatched to a CP call, it turns into a non into an emergency call, um, and you only have one provider who can really, uh, you know, who can operate within the EMS system. Is that a problem? Those are just some other thoughts that come to my mind. Well, this is, this is Howard again, and just to, to make sure we keep the focus on the on the question that at least we have primarily in California, it's not so much as, as Gary suggested the, the um, venue of practice, because remember, there these models are all responding in the field to 911 calls. They've just screened them and said, okay, this is probably a minor call that might be able to be treated and released by someone with a higher level license. So they're putting the nurse practitioner on to potentially, you know, the, the idea that they're going to be treating and releasing. So, the, but the question is, is what level of oversight and control does EMS have? They, we clearly, you know, the nurse practitioner works under her own license and scope of practice, and, and we don't have any any authority over that. But I would argue that even if you look at the air ambulance. Um, yes, we have nurses on there working at a higher, uh, you know, flight nurses working at a higher scope of practice, scope of practice than a paramedic because a lot of our units will fly a paramedic and, and a nurse. Um, it still falls to the extent that we can't do have control over over anything, you know, the FAA, whatever they've left us. Um, we do still have control over. Uh, the medical aspects uh, of of the air ambulance, and certainly when we're on the ground, we have even more responsibility and control. Uh, if it's our paramedic, they're working under their a license, which we provide, and um, and they're working out of the EMS system uh, through uh, through the 911 system. So, uh, I maybe the paramedics there as a backup. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know, uh, but I, I think that there's, you know, I brought it up because I do think, and in, in, in this discussion supports it, that there are some unanswered questions uh, about this, and so I was hoping that people who had been using this uh, model, maybe even in addition to community paramedicine, uh, would uh, would have some thoughts on that. Um, so I'm not sure there's any time you're using a paramedic that you ever uh, have get it completely out of the EMS system because your paramedic is bound by his 
uh, and he's bound to work under medical direction and protocol. So I, I think I disagree. I think it's a little bit of artificial distinction between MIH and CP because if you have a paramedic in the MIH system, and, and we're assuming that's the case, um, there's going to be some control by the EMS agency. Yeah, I, have, I, have, I would not argue that, um, argue with that at all. Um, I think that when you have CP, a community paramedic operating within, within an MIH, they are beholden to um, the offerer, the, the offerer of their license, the state EMS office. No question about that. It's kind of it's the reverse that I'm concerned about um, the the role of the mid level within a yeah, purely EMS organization such as you know CD is, um, and you know how that how that works um, or doesn't work. And clearly, some folks uh, believe that it that it um, offers value at um, either by being able to do some things uh, in the community that uh, CPs can't do or paramedics can't do, or by enabling reimbursement. Um, question is, does it work? Well, maybe uh, we should queue this up in the future with some specific questions and, and pull in some people who are actually using the model and see, uh, you know, so try and get some answers. Sorry, there was somebody else who wanted to comment. Uh, Robert Olmsted from Alaska. I'm a, uh, a nurse paramedic uh, practicing in the uh, remote um, island on Prince of Wales uh, in southeast Alaska, but I've also uh, practiced uh, on the North Slope uh, um, up in Barrow as well as the uh, Aleutian Islands. And uh, Alaska is a lot different, of course, than the lower 48. Uh, they use a, a large um, percentage of mid-level, very few doctors. Um, the paramedics here are licensed under the Board of Medical Examiners. Uh, but there's a um, real uh, blending of uh, basic uh, EMTs, ETTs, um, uh, and uh, we have the uh, health aides. Uh, the health aides up here practice very much um, like a community paramedic in regards that they uh, work in a clinic. They have a, a scope of practice uh, depending on their level. Um, uh, and they work under uh, their program and their doctors, but it's the blending of the multi-levels that Alaska seems to, in my opinion, have down very well. And even though there's different agencies and legislative authorities, uh, everyone has seemed to got together and they're, they're working um, within their, their um, boundaries, but yet uh, they're staying patient-focused and goal focused and um, so back to the original question about mid-levels uh, who's going to have the authority um, my comment is is as long as there's a strategy of cooperation and collaboration the architecture will hopefully uh, form itself through trial and error and um, I think it's real possible and there's a real contribution for mid-levels um, but I, I think the architecture is still un unknown Hey guys, it's Mike from New York. Yes, go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> Hi. So um, the um, I think where everybody falls in the mix here um, is is going to fall back to what their state license allows them to do. I mean, in in New York, we recently had legislation change that allows the nurse practitioners um, to work um, a whole lot more independent of physician oversight. Um, so they, I mean, they, they can open their own clinics. They can, they have to have um, uh, the ability to refer someone to a physician, but they don't necessarily have to have phys, um, physician oversight. So in that regard, um, a patient that a community paramedic may be seeing um, may not be the patient necessarily directly of a physician, but their, their primary care provider may truly be the nurse practitioner and it would be the nurse practitioner that would be writing the orders and giving the directions and such. Um, there, so I just wanted to bring to your attention that there, you know, the the, the role of of the uh, mid levels uh, is 
ever expanding also and mobile integrated healthcare is is going to have to adapt to to their um diff, uh you know, changing rules also um which means you know everybody in that MIH is going to have to adjust including the community paramedicine and such i i although the the thought is that um you know a paramedic is a paramedic you you this is some um, you work under medical direction um in, in some states, it may not be quite worded that way, and, and some states may have to enact um, community paramedicine programs in a way that may take the paramedic kind of outside the, the traditional scope of, of medical physician uh, direction and oversight. Um, so I, I just I think that that needs to be realized in this discussion is all I'm saying. Yeah, cool. Gary, I would, I would add on to that. That's a lot like what it is where... I'm from, we have lots of paramedics who work for clinics and hospitals, and they get delegated medical practice from the primary care practitioner that is supervising them, which um, isn't the ambulance medical director in a lot of cases. So what I was suggesting earlier is that regardless of the vehicle, the nurse practitioner and paramedic get to the patient, and because the nurse is billing using clinic codes and under a clinic's UPIN, the paramedic really is a part of the clinic rather than the reverse scenario, but when you introduce the option of of a transport to an alternative destination, that doesn't fit. And now you're back into transportation, you're back into the EMS system. So I think this is a complex web, and um, it really deserves more discussion. And um, thanks again, Dr. Backer, for bringing it up. We, we need to continue this discussion. Other comments? We have a few more minutes. Yeah, we're going through um, kind of a similar quandary in South Carolina with alternative transportation, uh, particularly because we've had several rural counties where the only community hospital they had is gone. And so what are left are not necessarily freestanding ERs, but free clinics in, in places that does some exterior um, medical care but it wouldn't be to the extent of an EOR or even an urgent care center. And so we're looking now at the possibility of adding alternative sites. And of course, now we're into crossing into various different uh, statues that the Office of EMS has no control over, but it's more certificate of need and health licensing and the uh, the Board of, uh, of Physicians. So. Um, that would be an interesting thing if if, uh, if, it, if it came up where we can transport based on a mid-level to a alternative uh, facility because right now that it's kind of against the law in South Carolina. Interesting. Um, okay. Um, well, it sounds like we've got uh, a whole show uh, suggested here uh, involving mid-levels and bring in some of the, the, the folks that are um, actually uh, doing these services uh, from around the country uh, and have some description of those programs and then uh, have this discussion again with them in the room. Um, does that sound like a plan, Dr. Backer? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Um, so we will, we will get that put together for sometime in the next few months and um, are there any other uh, uh, comments uh, anybody has before we close this out? Okay, well, listen, I want to thank uh, again Dr. Backer uh, for this discussion, um, Dr. O'Lear and uh, Tony Fernandez for um, their pieces of the first portion of the program today. Our next program will be on May the 16th, which is the beginning of EMS week. Um, and uh, we will be back at 3 p.m. on that third Monday of the month. Um, I want, to, again, to thank the FEMSO, NOSOR, and CLEAR uh, for supporting this, this program. Um, and uh, thank Gary Wingo for uh, having the technical wizardry to keep us moving ahead. Um, we will see you next month, uh, 3 p.m. on May the 16th.